Welcome to CS4510 uh, LO4B. This is sort of a filler uh, lecture. We need to talk about the relationship between the two things we've done so far. The title of the topic is closure, but it's a little more than that. It's the relationship between the context-free languages and the regular languages. So uh, we defined a model of computation called the context-free grammar, and it is tasked with production. And it does something different than an automata. Now, we also showed that it can do something that a regular device cannot do. A regular <coughs> device being, being an NFA, a DFA, uh, or a regular expression, and also technically, I guess, a GNFA. And, it, and then today, actually, a fifth regular uh, device. But we need to know how different is it. S you have two models. Sometimes they could be incomparable. They could be like that. We gave a grammar for A star, and we also gave a grammar for A to the end, B to the end. So we know there's a language that's regular and one that's not. So there's two cases. It could either look like that, or it could be strictly stronger. And it turns out it is actually just strictly stronger. So we know that L NFA is the class of languages uh, decided by an NFA. We know that L DFA is equivalent to L NFA. And we also know that L uh, Rex is the class of languages decided by a regular expression. These are all equivalent. These are all the regular languages. right? Um, we also know that because we gave a grammar for uh, a non-regular language, namely a to, the n, a to the n, b to the n, we know that the context free grammars are not equivalent. And today we're going to prove that it is a superset of uh, this. The NFAs are a, the languages decided by NFAs are a strict subset of those defined by decided by context free grammars. So we're going to sort of do this uh, actually two ways. But uh, before that, let's talk about some algebraic properties of uh, the languages. Uh, closure. You may have heard the word closure. Um, we say a set, uh, I don't know, S is closed under uh, an operation, let's call it triangle, if uh, a comma b or in s implies that a triangle b is an element of s right so for example if a and b are natural numbers then a plus b is a natural number or triangle here is a is a is a uh, any operation right that's we say a, a set is closed under an operation. If operating under that operation, you still remain in the set, right? So consider the natural numbers. What are some things that, that this is closed under and some things that maybe it's not closed under? What are some operations the naturals are closed under? Yeah. Addition and multiplication. Addition and multiplication. What else? Maybe exponentiation, I guess. XOR, maybe, I don't know. Other things like this. Plenty of operations that are fine. What are some of the things that are naturals are not closed under? Division, Division. yeah. 2 over 3. Um, what else? There's another important one the naturals are not closed under. Traction. Right. Uh, 3 minus 4 is negative 1. Uh, what about the integers? The integers are closed under most of the same stuff. You have addition, multiplication, exponentiation, but you also have subtraction. Uh, but they're not closed under. They're not closed under division still, right? Now the rationals are the rationals closed under division. Uh, zero. Ah, there you go. Okay, zero is technically a rational number. So if we say this. The, the, the rationals except zero, then these are closed under addition, multiplication. Is the exponentiation of two rational numbers a rational number? I think so. Uh, subtraction and also division and so on. So this is just some examples. Given a, ma given a set in an operation, we say that set is closed under that operation. If operating under the operation it remains in there, yeah. So the power of one over two. Yeah. I just did this. I just did this in 2050. We just proved that. And it's not close under exponentiation. OK. Um, correct. So what operations are the regular languages closed under? Um, and 
what operations do we have? We don't have mathematical operations. We have set theoretic operations. So we have uh, L, uh, let's say ln of A, is closed under what? Well, what are the ones we proved for the regular expression? What are the three operations of the regular expressions? Concatenation. What are the other two? Union. Union. I forgot the third. Star. star. By the way, the star is named after a guy named Clean. Clean. Uh, his name pops up everywhere. He, Clean, uh, he pronounced his own name Claney, but his dad pronounced his name Clean, and his son pronounces his name Clean. So when every time he would pronounce, someone would pronounce his name Clean, he would correct him and say Claney. But then his son was like, he was the only one who did that. It's not actually pronounced Claney. So he was just being weird for no reason. That's sort of an interesting anecdote. His name shows up everywhere in this, in this stuff. Um, most of the algorithms we gave so far, conversion of NFA to regular expression stuff, his name is attached to it. And he is what we call the star operation. Right. Uh, let's talk. There's two operations that the regular languages are closed under that are not considered part of the syntax of a regular expression. These are, the con these are complement and intersection. And these are sort of kind of the same operation. We'll talk about them today. For, we kind of alluded to in the very first lecture why the regular languages are closed under complement. But let's sort of write out the proof out loud so we make sure we remember. Um, let uh, L be regular. Then there is a DFA. D is equal to Q. Uh, D is equal to Q, sigma, Q0, delta, and F uh, to decide L. Consider the DFA D prime is equal to Q sigma Q0 delta Q minus F. So basically F complement. Right? Q minus F is basically F complement. Notice that uh, D prime accepts all strings a D rejects and D prime rejects all strings uh, D accepts. So D prime decides L complement since this is for any regular L, we see uh, the regular languages are closed under complement. Sorry, my writing is a little fast and loose there, a little rough. But that's sort of the proof. And all, we kind of maybe have said it out loud. Just flip the states. The sta every state either accepts or rejects. If it doesn't accept, it must reject, right? So just switch the answer around. Return every, change every return true for a return false. And you've, done a, you've created a program for the exact opposite. That's the complement of the language. It does the, it, it, if you have a language to decide something, if you have a DFA to decide something, you also have a different DFA to decide the exact complement. So we see the DFAs, the... Regular languages are closed under complement. Now, why did I have to use a DFA here instead of an NFA? Would have to do with implicit rejection and NFA. The complement of the DFA states is the is the complement of the language. That's not true for an NFA because NFA is implicit rejection. Take an NFA complemented states and observe that you have not necessarily complemented the language because there may be some strings that reject from both the NFA and the complement of the NFA. Non-determinism is a biased power. It's one-sided. It, determinism allows you to say yes and no with equal power. 
Non-determinism is really, really good at saying yes, but it's actually really bad. It's worse than a determinism at saying no. An, an NFA accepts if there exists a computation path. Great. But it rejects if all computation paths reject. So determining if an NFA rejects a word is much harder than determining if it accepts a word. Non-determinism, again, biased power. Uh, we can also prove that the NFAs are closed under intersection. We can do, we can do two proofs of this. We, oh, oh, wrong button again. NFAs, uh, not NFAs, the regular languages are closed under intersection. Uh, we proved this in the first lecture by literally constructing a DFA using the DFA Cartesian product, right? But we can prove this without actually constructing what the DFA is and just thinking about closure. So you don't have to write the code of something if you can just pretend you knew how to write the code and apply a little bit of math. So we'll prove that they're closed under intersection. Let L1, L2 be regular. Then so are L1 complement and L2 complement, right? Because the regular languages are closed under complement. Then so is. L1 complement union L2 complement. Then so is the complement of L1 complement union L2 complement, which is equal to what? De Morgan's law. L1 intersect L2. Right? So we can construct a DFA for the intersection of any two regular languages, but we didn't actually construct the DFA. We just said that. If L1 and L2 are any uh, regular languages, then L1 intersect L2 is also re regular. Now, a DFA, excuse me, an NFA also can't do intersection basically for the same reason it can't do complement. Recall how it did uh, union, right? This is basically how it did union. How would it do intersection? It, it can do or. The NFA can say one or the other, but how does it say both? Well, what you would have to do, unfortunately, is basically this. You would have to, comp you would have to convert these two to DFAs, which would, may require exponential blow up. Then you take the union of them, and then you take the complement of, of it again. So complement and intersection are not part of the regular expression syntax for this because regular expressions are non-deterministic, and they don't have access to complementation. Or and they do not have they don't have access to intersection either. You have to cast yourself back to the deterministic word world, do all your math there, and then maybe go back non-deterministic later. Kind of unfortunate. Um, you can use closure like this to prove languages are regular. You can also use closure to prove languages <coughs> are not regular. Consider uh, the Dick language. The Dick language is generated by uh, the context free grammar open S close or SS or epsilon, right? This produces all valid balanced parentheticalizations. Um, but like, could you have ever given a DFA for this? Assume to the contrary, you could have. Assume to the contrary. The Dick language is regular. Um, notice uh, open parentheses star, close parentheses star is also regular. Why is that a regular language? There's an easy answer and a hard answer to this question. That's just a regular. Yeah, that's a regular expression, so it's a regular language, obviously, right? By definition. Uh, then the Dick language intersect open star, close star would also be a regular language. The regular languages are closed under intersection. 
So you take two regular languages, assuming to the contrary that the Dick language is regular, you're left with a regular language. What is the intersection of the Dick language with open star, closed star? Parentheses to the end, parentheses to the end. But that equals open parentheses to the end, closed parentheses to the end, n is a number. But we proved via pumping that this language was not regular. Contradiction. Right? If the Dick language was like regular, you can intersect it and construct a DFA for uh, a to the n, b to the n. But we know such uh, it is impossible by the pumping lemma. So the Dick language must not be regular. Right? Questions on this one? We didn't have to pump the Dick language. We get to use a little bit of closure. Really powerful stuff. Pumping, kind of finicky, kind of annoying. Closure, kind of beautiful, I think. You get to sort of boom, 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 and then it's over. Uh, let's do one more closure proof to show something is not uh, not regular. I won't even write down the proof. Uh, consider the language uh, L uh, consists of words such that uh, uh, W is not a palindrome. All strings that are not palindromes. Why is this language not regular? You need memory to know if something is a palindrome. So that is intuition, but what, give me a proof why it's not regular. Convince anyone why is the, le the set of strings that are not palindromes, uh, why is the set of strings that are not palindromes also not regular? Do we know that the set of palindromes is not regular? We proved it via pumping yesterday. And then you can say that uh, this is the intersection of all languages with the complement of languages that are palindromes. And both well, simpler than that. But yeah, that's basically the answer. Assume to the contrary, I'll write it out. Assume to the contrary, L was regular, then so would be L complement. Contradiction. What is L complement? Palindrome. Everything that isn't not a palindrome is a palindrome. So the complement of a non-regular language must also be non-regular. The complement of a to the n, b to the n, for a similar <coughs> reason, is not regular. Right? So something not being regular, uh, its complement must also not be regular. So the non-regular languages are also closed under complement for the same reason the regular languages are closed under complement. Right. Now let's talk about the relationship between uh, that button. Let's talk about the relationship between the context-free languages and the regular languages. We'll prove this picture like I promised. So we'll talk about a, uh, another model of computation called a regular grammar. We just finished the context-free uh, context grammars produce exactly and only the context-free languages. But you can make a special case of them to only produce regular languages. A context-free grammar has rules of the form v goes to a string of terminals and non-terminals. Right? So you can have like a goes to little b, capital C, capital D, little e, capital F, little g, capital H, whatever, something like that. Right? In contrast, a regular grammar only has rules of v goes to sigma v. What that means is a single non-terminal, a single non-terminal A goes to a single terminal and a single non-terminal. That's it. Restricted rules. Immediately you don't get ASB. You don't get A to the N, B to the N. You have a very simple kind of rule that's allowed. That's it. Here you're allowed um, 
both rules are restricted in the sense the left-hand side is a single non-terminal, but the right-hand side of a context-free grammar is unrestricted. There's nothing containing it. Here, there's a, there's a kind of rule you're allowed. That's it. Single terminal, single non-terminal. That's it. And you may guess that the regular grammars are, uh, they produce exactly in only the regular languages. So let me make some room here. The regular grammar, every regular grammar, though, is a context-free grammar. Do you agree? It's a special case. It, the context-free grammar is a general, generalization of the regular grammar. So if we can prove that the regular grammars decide exactly in only the regular languages, that would, that would prove that every regular language also has a context-free grammar, making it a strict subset and not something orthogonal or weird. Now, we won't actually do this proof fully. We'll just kind of explain it. And then we'll finish the proof of containment by closure. It'll be much simpler that way. But let's just describe what the, what the, uh, why the regular grammars uh, work. And it's like if you have a DFA, let's say you have a DFA structure, something that looks like you have uh, Q0 to QK, you're going to add a reg to your regular grammar, you're going to add non-terminals S, Q, capital Q0 to capital QK. Something like this. And if uh, then you're going to make uh, S is going to go to Q0. It's going to be your start non-terminal. And if you have a transition of the form QI, if you read an A, you're going to go to some state QJ. You're going to make sure you do the same thing in your grammar. You're going to go um, from the state QI to A QJ. Right? Notice that this grammar is producing the string left to right the same way that the DFA is reading the string left to right. If this transition is taken, then this non-terminal in the working string, this non-terminal QI is replaced with the non-terminal AQJ. And then A is produced by the grammar exactly when A is read by the DFA. Then you do like if QF is a final state, you would add production QF goes to the empty string, something like this. And then you would just make sigma the same. Right. So these are, these are a set of productions to correctly simulate a DFA. Uh, why do you need this? Uh, if, if it's a final state, why do you have this epsilon rule? Yeah, question? You need, you need to finish it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to stop production when uh, you finish reading the word. So when you're at a final state, you can say, I give up. I'm going to stop. I'm going to put my... Uh, I'm going to throw my cards down. Um, notice that you stop production when you're out of non-terminals. Every time you read a terminal, you add exactly and only one other terminal. Non-terminal, excuse me. Every time you read a non-terminal, you add one terminal and one non-terminal. So you always have one non-terminal. So actually, although in general, context-free grammars are non-deterministic, because given a rule like this, you can choose which one to produce. Here, you can choose, you choose, ex you choose only one. Right? There's only one non-terminal to replace. Now, if the DFA has, um, if it's a DFA and not an NFA, there's also no choice of productions to apply. There's exactly one QI goes to something QJ. There's only one of those for each A and B. Right? So this will produce all the words and only the words that the NFA, or the, excuse me, the DFA accepts. If the NF, if the, if the DFA does not produce a word, there will be a production of it here, but it will not be able to terminate because there won't be a rule that QI goes to the empty string. Right? So that's the way this produces all correct strings. Now, why don't we just actually use this to prove the correctness? Let me outline the proof of this to show you kind of how hard it is. Uh, this proof has four parts that are all redundant, and you can't just say without loss of generality and kind of hope to wave things away. In general, automata correctness proofs are not done because I think they're annoying. Uh, let uh, L have NFA N construct regular grammar G, and then we would prove that the, the strings that it accepts are produced by the grammar, and the strings produced by the grammar are accepted by the NFA. And then you would have to do the other way. Let L have regular grammar 
a G uh, construct a, a different NFA uh, N. We'll say G prime. We'll say N prime. Uh, and simulate the uh, grammar on the NFA. So the grammar, the strings the grammar accepts are accepted by the NFA, and the strings that the NFA accepts had to be uh, produced by the grammar. Now, that's four cases, and each of them is required. You can't if and only if or without also generally, generality way you're out of that, and it's kind of long and tedious. Uh, and actually, the construction of R from G and N, excuse me, N from G and G from N is actually a little tedious, and there's little edge cases and things like this, you know, starting and, and so on, accepting. Um, kind of annoying. So we're not going to do that proof because that sounds annoying. But perhaps it's enough to convince you just from the construction that it's correct, right? Now, this is not a good enough proof, I think, to tell you that every regular language is one that's context-free. We have not yet sufficiently eliminated this case. But in fact, we can still convert one of our automaton, one of our uh, regular devices, into context-free grammars correctly. Uh, and also add L, G, and FA here for fun. So there's five devices there that are all regular. Um, which one of these should we convert to a context-free grammar if you had to pick one? Regular grammar. Uh, actually, the regular grammar would is easy to convert to a context-free grammar because it's just sort of trivially, yeah. yeah. But we didn't convert the NFA correctly to the regular grammar, so that one doesn't. That proof is, is unsatisfying. What's another one we could choose? There's only five choices. Regular expressions. Regular expressions. Yeah, regular expressions are production devices. They're a, 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 a description of a, of a language, and it turns out really easy, almost trivially, you can. Um, you can convert a regular expression into a context-free grammar. Uh, and we can do so by induction. What is a regular grammar by, excuse me, a regular expression is one of the following. It's A, B, empty string, empty set. Uh, if R, I, and R, J are regular, expression, regular expressions, then so is R, I, union R, J. R i concatenated with R j, and then R i star, right? Oh, let me change the. And R i star, right? We can prove that we proved every regular expression has an NFA with induction. Let's prove every regular expression also has a context-free grammar with induction, right? Um, base cases, we'll, we'll, we proceed by structural induction. Give me a context-free grammar for uh, the letter A. Give me a context-free grammar for the letter B. Okay, give me a context-free grammar for the empty string. Give me a context-free grammar for the empty set. Yeah. Base case done. Every base case regular expression has a context-free grammar. Now we assume by the induction hypothesis. Let uh, SI, SJ be start non terminals. For uh, CFGs, context free grammars that produce regular languages. Uh, LI, uh, LJ. We give uh, context-free grammars for li union lj, li concatenated with lj, and li star. Right. Let suppose we want uh, to construct a context-free grammar for the union of two gra uh, of the languages that is produced by two other context-free grammars. How do we do that? We could add to 
uh, SI, another option that goes to like R, or that goes to SJ, and SJ doesn't go back. So once you uh, choose to go to the next string, you can't go back to, and so it's concatenated. Wait, are we doing union? Let's do union first. And both ways. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, let's do that one in a second. S goes to SI or SJ. You add a new start non-terminal. Non-deterministically choose, do you produce SI or do you produce SA, SJ? SI is a start non-terminal for some grammar. SJ is a start non-terminal for some other grammar. You add a new start non-terminal and you produce the union of those two. That will correctly produce anything SI produces or anything SJ produces. So S produces the union, right? How would you, how would you do the concatenation? I would add to the end to SI an option to go to SJ. OK. I think it's simpler. For the concatenation, you can do SI, SJ. Oh, sorry. Yes. If SI produces any string produced in LI and SJ produces any string in LJ, then SI, SJ, this is going to produce some strings. This is going to produce some other strings, right? And then. Concatenation of the non-terminals is simply going to produce the concatenation of the languages, right? Now here's the here's the a tricky one. Give me a way. Give me a, a, we can add a new start non-terminal. Give me a way to produce li star. S goes to v. V goes to like oh, okay. You you could do s goes to s i s and then or like or v. Or V, and what is V? Like V is just a way to like add epsilon, but without having only epsilon in case. You can have only epsilon. Oh, no, I guess you can. Oh, then you're chilling. Yeah, perfect. This will, do N, this will do a certain number of copies of S. S goes to SI. S goes to SSI. S goes to SISI, and so on, right? This will produce a certain number of, cop, number of concatenations of the start on terminal of SI with itself, and then I'll do that one. So these are three ways you can. Uh, create a grammar for the union. And this uh, is sufficient. We proved that every, this is also a way to convert any regular expression, the same way, reason it's a way to convert any uh, NFA, uh, excuse me, any regular expression into an NFA, structural induction. You can convert any regular expression into uh, a context-free grammar. It's the same thing. You could do like, let's do A star, B star. So you could do S goes to A, B, uh, A goes to A, A, or epsilon, B goes to B, B, or epsilon, right? Same thing. A and B are the start non-terminals of A star and B star, and then A is produced using uh, whatever methods we've done, concatenation and so on, right? Awesome. Now this also proves that the context-free languages are closed under union, concatenation, and star, right? This proof is done. This also proves that L, a CFG, is closed under union concatenation and star. The regular languages are closed under union concatenation they're closed under star, they're closed under complement, and they're closed under intersection. The, the, we sort of use the closure to project it upwards to prove that every regular language is also a context-free one. And the regular language, excuse me, the context-free languages, L, C, F, G is the context-free languages. A language is context-free, it's produced by context-free grammar. This is the set of strings that can be produced that have grammars to produce them. It turns out that the regular, uh, excuse me, the context-free grammars, although are closed under union, concatenation, and star. They're closed under the regular operations. They're not closed, it turns out, under complement. And the, the context-free languages are also not closed under uh, intersection. Let's prove that real quick. Should not have erased this picture. I'll have to redraw it. Um, 
So assume uh, a to the n, b to the n, c to the n, n is a number, is not context free. Now, we will prove that. We haven't s described how to prove a language is not context free. We just only introduced the, the context free languages today. But I'll go ahead and tell you that this language is not context free. Uh, think about the difference between a context free language and a regular language. A context free language is like, it can keep track of only a few things at once. When we, we did a to the n, b to the n, we did like s goes to a, s, b. Uh, or epsilon. There's no way to do You can keep track of one thing at a time. You can't really keep track of two things at a time. So in some sense, a context-free grammar does have a little bit of memory, whatever it can store into the working string, but not enough memory to recall a variable twice. Kind of weird yet to make a programming analogy to what possible thing could uh, a context-free grammar do. It's definitely more powerful than a DFA or an NFA, but measurably so, we're not yet sure. And I'll go and tell you some foreshadowing that we can prove later on that a to the n, b to the n, c to the n is not a context-free language. We can use the fact that it's not context-free. First off, it's definitely not regular. You can pump that language for the same reason you can pump a to the n, b to the n. You, you do a to the p, b to the p, c to the p, and then you'll end up with a to the b plus p, and then you'll say, well, that's not the same number of a's as b's, something like this. So it's definitely not regular. You can also prove it's not context-free through similar proof, but for now, we'll just assume it's not context-free. Consider the following languages instead. Consider uh, a to the n, b to the n, c to the m. n, m are numbers. Is this language re is this co language context free? What? Give me a grammar for this language. Um, you do like s goes to a s b. Like, I was going to, like, little a, big S, middle B, and then, like, capital C. You couldn't, just... couldn't do that. You couldn't. Why? Because the C, do it again, you'll have B, C, B, C, B, C, B, C. Ah, true. So what you should do is something like delegation, R, C, or epsilon, and then C goes to C, C, or epsilon, and then R goes to A, R, B, or epsilon. That would work, right? Um, you could then also consider the language uh, a to the m, b to the n, c to the n, and is a num n and m are numbers, right? Similar language. Give me a grammar for this one. A C, where a is a a or epsilon and c is uh a c. all right one more time oh say one more time uh a goes to a capital a or epsilon and c goes to b capital c, c lowercase c or epsilon yeah there we go that would work basically it's a star concatenated with b to the n c to the n right now what is the intersection of these two languages Yeah, this is the, the intersection of these two languages is a to the n, b to the n, c to the n. Assume to the contrary that the context-free languages are closed under intersection. This is a context-free language. We gave a grammar. This is a context-free language. We gave a grammar. The intersection of them must be then context-free, but we know it's a non-context-free language. Contradiction. So the context-free languages are not closed under contradiction. Uh, why are the context-free languages also not closed under intersection? I mean, excuse me, complement. This is a set theory question rather than a device question. Intuitively, they should not be closed under complement. A DFA has the ability to yell an answer. It rejects a string. A Context-free grammar only produces correct strings. So how do you know if a string is not produced by a grammar? It's a little hard to know if a, if a grammar doesn't produce a string. Uh, so the, it's not obvious that the grammar can give you a signal that says no. But for just closure reasons, why is the 
set of context-free languages not closed under complements. Because if it were, then it would also have to be closed under intersection. Yeah. Intersection and complement are basically the same operation if you have union. Uh, if, uh, assume to the contrary, the CFLs are closed under complement. Then uh, L1, L2, then let L1, L2 be CFLs. Then so would be uh, L1 complement union, L2 complement, whole thing complemented. But that's simply equal to L1 intersect L2 contradiction. Right. Given, given intersection, or excuse me, given complement, you can quickly go to union. Bleh. Given complement, you can quickly go to intersection. You actually, given intersection, you can quickly go to complement as well, right? You can prove the complement. You can, given complement, you can get intersection. Given intersection, you can get complement, right? Um, so the context free languages are also not closed under complement. Again, it makes sense because they don't have a way to like blurt out an answer. They don't have a way to say no. They only say yes to the right things. And they're silent on the, on the no answers. Unlike a DFA, which does send you a signal if it rejects something. Uh, here's another remark we can make, make about this. We proved that NFAs and DFAs were equivalent. We able, were able to construct a deterministic simulator of a non-deterministic device. The context-free grammar is inherently non-deterministic. And so the next question is, OK, can we de non deterministify the object? And the answer, surprisingly, is no not without weakening it, that the context-free languages are not equivalent to the deterministic context-free languages. If you could make a context-free language deterministic, you could also create a context-free language, a deterministic context-free language for the complement, simply because it's deterministic. A deterministic device can tell you yes or no at, with equal power. right? So it turns out that be, the same reason that the context-free languages are not closed under intersection and complement is the same reason the context-free languages are not, cannot be effectively de non determinisified. And I'm using that made word, de non determinisified. But if you were to draw the picture again, you have L NFA, L DFA, L regular expression, L regular grammar, L GNFA, and like 10 other things turns out to all accidentally and exactly decide the regular languages. We know this is now a superset, a subset of uh, the context-free languages. But if you were to put uh, deterministic context-free languages in there, they would contain all the regular languages, but unfortunately they would not be equal to the context-free languages. Right? The context-free language is inherently a grammatical, not a deterministic device. Um, any questions on that? Today was just an introduction to programming. Contrary languages and some uh, cool closure proofs. All right.